in the spring of 2020, the sudden disappearance of Rosalia Gutierrez stunned the people of Kenosha, Wisconsin. As the investigation went on, Zachariah Anderson became the main suspect and was eventually convicted of murder even though Gutierrez's body was never found. The case against Anderson was based on indirect evidence and included claims of biased investigation, unclear forensic evidence, and questionable actions by the prosecutors. Rosalio Gutierrez was last seen on May 17th in 2020. When his friends and families couldn't reach him, they reported him missing. Police did a welfare check and found his apartment in chaos. Bloodstains, a broken mirror, and signs of a struggle suggested something bad had happened. Despite thorough searches, they never found Gutierrez's body, making his disappearance even more mysterious. Law enforcement quickly focused on Zachariah Anderson, who had a past relationship with Sadie Beecham, one of the women Gutierrez was seen at the time. The police believed Anderson, driven by jealousy and anger, had killed Gutierrez. This narrow focus was criticized because the police seemed to ignore other possible leads, including people to whom Gutierrez owed a lot of money. During the police interview, Anderson was asked tough questions about his phone and whether he'd been stalking his ex-girlfriend, Sadie Beecham, who was also the mother of his children. Anderson strongly denied stalking her, he explained that he was worried Beecham might be involved with drugs, and was concerned for their children's safety and wanted evidence to gain custody. Police told Anderson they had spoken to his daughter, who had said nice things about him, but raised concerns about possible stalking. Anderson responded that his daughter had a history of lying and had been caught stealing her aunt's phone. The officers doubted that an 11 or 12 year old girl would lie to the police. Anderson thanked them for trusting his daughter, but insisted he knew better than they did sharing a story about her falsely claiming to have leukemia for two months at school. When asked if he had given his daughter a phone to spy on her mother, Anderson clarified that he gave her a phone because she said that her mother had hit her and also taken her phone. He wanted her to be able to use the phone to record any future incidents. Feeling that he was getting nowhere with the police, Anderson requested a lawyer and said he wanted to leave. The police then told him that he would be spending 48 hours in jail until his bail hearing, which shocked Anderson. He continued to maintain his innocence and deny any stalking, telling him he believed what he was doing was within the law. But what I can tell you is, I don't know what you guys are doing. I'm tired of either take me home or give me a lawyer because I'm not really, what you're doing is really odd. It was almost like a threat of a computer, and that's peculiar to me. Well, threat in the case involving stalking. She's alleging that you've been tracking her, you're tracing her with electronic devices and things like that. I don't think I crossed any line. Yeah, I did it, but I don't think I crossed any line. Well, that's what he's saying, like we're going to get the information from those devices. All right, we'll do my Google searches or whatever you guys got to do, but something's... I don't know. Like I said, if you're going to threaten me about keeping a journal, Dude, I, ain't I, was. I ain't threatening you. You're just telling me you have a journal in everything you do. So that No, I didn't say everything I do. You. I didn't say everything I do. Okay. Well, so I mean, wait, if you want to twist words too, like Sadie, man, I don't know what the f it's going to do. Us, we're trying to have a conversation about stuff. I'm trying to tell you how things go, but I don't know what you're doing over there. It's weird. Okay. Yeah, but all he's saying is that we're going to. We'll go to the journal. Okay. No, yeah, I don't I'll be happy to share it to you. I don't know how many steps I take. I don't think you need the journal or shit like that, too. But I, I also know two nights ago. The journal is at my place. Literally called custody for my kids' well being. I mean, what the f? So that's what we're asking, but what what computer or electronic device that is it on? Dude, give me a lawyer. Take me home. You pick. This is crazy. This is fing nuts. All right, we're done. We can't talk to you no more. I didn't do it. I don't know what you want from me. This is crazy. I don't think I crossed any lines. All right. Um, so what's going to happen is the officer's going to take you over across the street. Um, jail, you have... Well, what time is it? It's midnight. Um, within 40 hours, you'll have a preliminary hearing. For, for what? Stuff. So... I can't guarantee you. 48 hours? What the f then 48 hours, I said. It could be tomorrow at 1 o'clock, or else it'll be Tuesday at 1 o'clock. I don't know the exact time. 
tomorrow morning we will have a meeting with our district attorney office. I didn't it's do it to her. What are you talking well, about? That's what's happening tonight. So we can't talk about it anymore. You have a question, attorney. So that that's what's going to happen tonight. I just want to make you aware of that. This is bananas, you guys. All right. For stalking, get the fuck out of here. Yep, that's the, the charge. <laughs> come on now, really? Yep. So we need just a minute. I'll get the officers to come in here, and then they'll we'll get you out of here like you requested. All right? Yeah. What the? A key part of the prosecution's case was the discovery of a small amount of possible DNA in Anderson's van, supposedly belonging to Gutierrez. This DNA was found on the mat in the back of his vehicle. However, forensic experts testified that the DNA evidence was inconclusive and couldn't definitively be identified as blood. This uncertainty raised significant doubts about the reliability of evidence and the strength of the case against Anderson. And when you say they were all negative, what does that mean? There was no indication of blood um, using phenothalene as the presumptive test. Yes, yeah, so usually when we start out looking for blood, we're using basically just a high intensity flashlight looking for any signs that appear to be reddish brown stains as blood usually appears to look. After that, um, if you, something that you can't see with your eye, we might employ luminol, which um, you may have seen on TV. If you spray it in the dark, it, instead of giving a color change, it gives a, a change of light. Can you explain to the jury if luminol reacts to any other substances or things other than blood? It does. It's just a presumptive test, like phenothalene. It'll react to rust, bleach, and some other kind of cleaning products. You had noted that one thing that another thing that luminol can react to is rust. Did you observe any areas of rust in and around the vehicle? Yes, the car did have rust. Based on the fact that there was no testing, that there's no way to scientifically confirm that the stain or what the swab or the whatever it was, was blood. Correct? Correct. I did not confirm the swab for blood. So it's possible that it could be blood. Also possible it could be from, um, not the stain, but the DNA could be from skin cells. That would be a possibility. I have no further questions for this witness. DNA results require weight and probability, which neither was provided in this case. Unfortunately, jurors tend to overevaluate DNA testing as simple and infallible when this is far from the case. The trial had its share of controversy, especially regarding the testimony of Mark Con Washington, Anderson's former cellmate. Washington claimed that Anderson had confessed to the murder while they were both in jail, saying he was woken up by Anderson having a nightmare and yelling, die, die, die in his sleep. Observers noticed that during Washington's testimony, District Attorney Michael Gravely seemed to move his lips along with Washington's words, suggesting that the testimony might have been rehearsed or even fabricated. The judge reviewed the lip-moving incident, found it inconclusive, and denied the defense request to strike the testimony from the record. I was laying there the night um, before. I told him about it the next day, but I was laying there and I was reading my book and I heard him um, shout in his sleep before he woke himself up. And, and what did he shout that you heard? He said, die, 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 mother uh, and you're Additionally, another inmate, Nicholas Ryan McAtee, who had claimed the state prosecutors had originally offered him an agreement to testify against Anderson, came forward, which DNA gravely objected to multiple times, and claimed that Washington had told him it was smart to testify in court even if it wasn't the truth, in exchange for a chance at a reduced sentence. Unlike Mark on Washington, who would be given a reduced sentence recommendation, McAtee had no benefit to testify on behalf of Zachariah Anderson. 
Now, this was done outside the jury for the judge to make a determination if it had any bearing on the trial. Despite this potential impact on this revelation, the judge ruled the testimony inadmissible, preventing the jury from hearing this crucial piece of evidence. His name was Mark Juan Washington. I had ran into him before in there, but only briefly. We didn't really know each other. We really just started talking because we both had federal cases, and there's not many people in KCDC with federal cases. So did there come a time when uh, the discussion between you two turned to him talking about jumping on other people's cases? Yes. What did he say when, um, when that subject came up? Essentially, he was giving me advice because one of the things that we talked about with our federal cases that we're facing so much time, um, and one of the ways he said that if you want to get out of your case, the easy thing to do is to just jump on someone else's case. And I had heard the term before, but he clarified and, and told me more about how to go about doing that. Did you ask him about, like, to explain that more to you? about how he did it or how what his thinking process I didn't ask him. He was volunteering his method, I guess you could call it. And he told me what he did. And, you know, he found out information about people's cases and whether it was going through their discovery or just asking them or seeing stuff in the news or newspaper and, and using that to put himself into it by informing detectives that he had information. And did he say what he would do if he didn't know something about the case? He would make something up. He said, as far as he was concerned, it was his life or someone else's. And he said, you know, he would do that to save himself. Why did you choose to testify for the defense? Because I felt like it was the right thing to do, to bring the truth out and not do something just to try to gain some freedom. The district attorney in Zachariah Anderson's case, Michael Gravely, is a supervisor at the same office that had previously attempted to convict Kyle Rittenhouse. Despite clear video evidence showing that Rittenhouse acted in self-defense during the 2020 Kenosha unrest, the prosecution still pursued charges against him. Whether you agree with what Rittenhouse did or the law, it was clearly within the laws of self-defense. In that trial, one witness, Nathan De Bruin claimed that the prosecutors tried to coerce him to change in a story to strengthen their case, raising doubt about the integrity of the prosecution's office. This history added the concerns about the fairness and reliability of the prosecution in Anderson's case. Mr. De Bruin, you said there was a lot of tension in the room when you met with me and Mr. Binger and Ms. Beasy? Yes. Is it fair to say that you were very nervous? Yeah, absolutely. And we did have you read over your statement, right? Correct. And we asked if you knew anything beyond that statement. Correct. We didn't ask you to change it. You, yes, you did. The prosecution presented surveillance footage of Anderson buying cleaning wipes and small kitchen trash bags, along with other items at a Walmart, implying that this showed an attempt to cover up the crime. Now, one would think if covering up a bloody crime scene instead of cleaning wipes, one may look to purchase paper towels, bleach, and other stronger cleaning materials. They also noted that he parked further away from the entrance, even though closer spaces were available, suggesting he had something to hide. Now, some people park further away at Walmart and other stores for the sole purpose of not needing to wait on other people in the parking lot. However, his purchases happened during the COVID-19 pandemic, a time when such items were commonly bought due to heightened cleaning protocols and shortages of household supplies. Anderson's defense argued that this purchase was completely normal for the time and should be seen as an evidence of guilt. Despite the controversies and questions surrounding the evidence of the prosecution's conduct, the jury found Zachariah Anderson guilty of Rosalio Gutierrez's murder and of stalking Sadie Beecham. The verdict received mixed reactions. Some felt that justice had been served, while others believed the trial had been fundamentally flawed and that reasonable doubt remained. 
Now, this case continues to generate debate. Supporters of Anderson argue that the investigation was biased and that other leads, such as those related to Gutierrez's financial troubles, were not adequately explored. They also point to the inconclusive nature of the DNA evidence and the prosecutor's suspicious behavior during Washington's testimony as indicators of a potentially wrongful conviction. During the sentence, the judge scolded Zachariah Anderson for maintaining his innocence, emphasizing the jury had found him guilty, and his denial sounded as if to rebuke the jury. It's worth noting that this was the judge's last trial before his retirement. While this fact may not generally bear on the case, the evidence he allowed or disallowed during the trial takes a greater significance in this context. In re the matter, State of Wisconsin versus Zachariah Joseph Anderson, as in the first count of the information, we the jury find the defendant, Zachariah Anderson, guilty of stalking Sadie Beecham as charged. As to the third count, of the information, we, the jury, find the defendant, Zachariah Anderson, guilty of intentional homicide for the first degree as charged. Several YouTube channels featuring attorneys like Legal Vices and Aussie Overlord had streamed the trial while giving their analysis on the trial. These attorneys appeared shocked by many of the judge's decisions the prosecutor's seemingly unethical misconduct and the verdict itself. They don't want the uh, prison snitch counter witness uh, so, to testify. Uh, I think, uh, I, I'm not disagreeing that of course uh, anything not, Mark Washington said at regarding this issue can be yeah, asked they, of they the Mark They have the statements, but they don't know uh, what else he might say. That is appropriate. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. one thing I do the case of Wisconsin v. Zachariah Anderson remains a deeply troubling and complex legal saga. The narrow focus of the investigation on Anderson, the inconclusive DNA evidence, allegations of prosecutorial misconduct, and the exclusion of potentially exculpatory testimony all contribute to lingering doubts about the fairness of the trial. While Anderson has been convicted, the lack of a body and the many unanswered questions continue to cast a long shadow over the case, leaving some to wonder if true justice was served. There is a continuing effort for Zachariah Anderson's appeal, which is going to require a lot of money. His family, seen on many of the YouTube channels featuring lawyers, has set up a website and a gifts and go page to help with the cost of the appeal process. Thank you for watching Legends and Legacies. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Have a great day everyone, and see you next time.